Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. We have a special episode today to help celebrate International Women's Day on the 8th of March. I'm delighted that we're going to be speaking to Jane Robinson, who is a British social historian specializing in the study of women pioneers in various fields. Jane is a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, member of the Society of Authors and founding member of Writers in Oxford. Jane has written a huge number of books talking about women, wayward women, women who travel, women who adventure. She has got some fascinating stories to share with us. Her most recent book is Hearts and Minds, the untold story of the great pilgrimage and how women won the vote, which is very timely seeing as it is 2018. Hi, Jane. Hello. How are things with you? They're great, thank you very much. So, Jane, I know you're a full-time writer and lecturer, and you specialise in social history through women's eyes, but would you like to sort of introduce yourself and tell everybody just a little bit more about you? I grew up in Yorkshire, and I always loved collecting books. I guess it's ever since I was banned from the local library because I used a jam tart for a bookmark. In my copy of Squirrel Nutkin, except the problem was it was their copy of Squirrel Nutkin. So that meant that I had to start collecting books myself. And books have always been an abiding interest. Um, I did English at university, but then went straight into the book trade afterwards and worked in an antiquarian bookshop that specialised in travel and adventure. And I got interested in women travellers and women adventurers. Um, My first book was about them. And it's kind of gone on from there, really. I've just done my 10th. I'm working on my 11th. Oh, fantastic. I absolutely love it. And especially sort of women travellers and women adventurers. I mean, how did that how did that come about? Was it a, a certain book that you read or was it just you wanting to learn more about travelling? No, I tell you what it was. I mean, my whole writing career really is thanks to a collector from America who came into the shop one day and said that he wanted to collect every single book that had been written by a woman traveller. Um, and I'd been working in the shop for a while and I knew that, oh, I knew about 10, 15 books by women travellers. So I said, if he'd come back in a couple of days, I'd have a bibliography for him. I'd have a list of all the books that had been written by women travellers. And so he trotted off um, and I trotted off to the local library and suddenly started realising that there weren't 10 or 15 books, that there weren't 100 or 150, that there were loads and loads and loads and this guy came back in two days time and I had to explain look I'm sorry I've been working on it solidly for a day and a half and I still haven't come to the end of the list so um, you'll either have to change what you're going to collect or come back a long time later on and I was telling this to a friend of mine who was a writer and he said well why don't you compile you know a proper list why don't you publish a bibliography of books by women travellers And I thought that was probably quite a good idea. So back I go to the library and then I start reading titles like On Sledge and Horseback to Outcast Siberian Lepers or To Lake Tanganyika in a Bath Chair. And I think, hang on a minute, I'm not interested in these books so much. I want to know more about these women. So that's how it all began. Oh, my God, that's absolutely fascinating. I mean, how how many books are there? Have you ever finished the list? Well, I did do my first book was called Wayward Women, and it was a kind of biographical dictionary of women who had written and had published first hand travel accounts. And there's about 400 in there, but I must have left twice as many out because I just couldn't fit them in the book. Um, And these are women who did extraordinary things. But at that stage, they had been almost completely forgotten. And people tend to think of a certain group of Victorian women like um, Isabella Bird and Marianne North and people like that. But I mean, the first travel account by a woman was back in the fourth century. Um, and they, they've been traveling and writing about their travels for centuries and centuries. And they're such amazing women. I just felt really strongly that it's time their voices were heard. And I guess that's what 
has fueled the whole of my writing career, really. It's finding people whose voices I think really need to be heard again. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's always very similar to what I'm trying to do with the podcast, which is to interview these female explorers, adventurer, adventurers, athletes, just because their stories just don't get heard. Their voices just don't get heard. I mean, going back to your first book, Wayward Women, I'm, you know, over 400 women and obviously so many other women who got left out. Was that... There- I mean, I'm sure there was more than one story, but could you share a story which really stands out for you that, you know, it still really inspires you in some way? Oh, my goodness. Well, there were so many, but I think one of the people who made a huge impression on me was Mary Seacole, who was born in Jamaica, 1805, um, illegitimate, but her father was a Scottish soldier. Her mother was the local, what was called doctress or, or a sort of local healer. And her mother used to keep a hotel as well, and it catered for the um, officers at the local British garrison. So Mary Seacole grew up with very little advantages, really, given that she was a girl um, in an area of the British Empire where slavery still obtained. And yet she went on to become one of the most luminous, most famous people in the Victorian era, really. She was just as famous as Florence Nightingale. And what she did um, to secure her fame was to nurse British soldiers in the Crimea um, in the 1850s. Huge character. And she didn't rely on anybody's approval to do what she did. She just decided what she was going to do. And despite her circumstances, and despite the fact that no Victorian woman was supposed to go anywhere on her own, let alone cross continents, she just went out and did it. And because she was so warm, and so immediate, everybody loved her. But when she died, because she was black, she was forgotten. Oh, it's just, it's, it's so heartbreaking to think of all these incredible women that we just don't know about. I mean, when you, how did you research these women? How did you find out about their, their stories? I did a lot of research in places like the British Library and the Bodleian Library, which are copyright libraries. So they have a copy of every book that has been published in this country and quite a few books that have been published elsewhere as well. And you know what it's like when you start on a bit of research, one thing leads to another. Um, And so just week by week and month by month, this amazing world was opening up to me, peopled by the most extraordinary characters I'd ever come across. And it was such a treat. And it's carried on being a treat because I've been meeting these people with every single book. What were the sort of the common themes that you kept coming across? I think the common theme of my work has been to look at social history through women's eyes. Um, And I think a lot of social history is in the sort of, I was going to say kingdom, queendom, what do we call it? It is in the environment of of women's lives because they're the ones who are just doing the ordinary stuff. And I I always loved history, but I got a bit bored of the big dates and and the big battles and, and the big men and the big statues and all that. And I became captivated by women just going about their lives, whether we thought they were extraordinary or not, because that just tells you so much about who we are. And it tells you about our great grandmothers, our great great grandmothers. These people belong to us. And I'm not so interested in in celebrity and, and famous people. I just want ordinary people to speak to us. Yeah, real stories from real women, real voices getting heard. How long were you researching it for? Most of my books take about a year to research and a year to write. I mean, in the in the early days, I mean, my first book came out just um, a couple of months before I had my first child, so there were certain interruptions at that stage. Um, but but usually the cycle is a, a year for research and a year to write. How how is sort of researching these wayward women? Love the title. Have have they been sort of inspired you in your own life? They really have. I mean. I, I do love to travel, although I could never do the sort of things that they've done. Or maybe I could. That's a very wimpish thing to say, isn't it? I'm sure I could. Um, but I think the way they've inspired me most is through their spirit. And you must have come across this in, in the people that you've interviewed for your podcasts. There are certain people who are just so sure of themselves, not in a conceited way or an arrogant way, but they just know that that what they feel and what they want to do is right for them. And I just think that level of confidence is really infectious. 
Mm. And it's even, I mean, one of the things that, that we sort of talk about quite a lot on the podcast is around the, the fears and it's like the, the fears of judgment and what are people going to think of me and and can I do this and dealing with sort of maybe imposter syndrome. And yet many of the women that I speak to still have all these fears. They're not superhuman, they're not different, but they just go out there and, and do it. Well, I was going to say, not just that, it, it's that they articulate those fears uh, and, and they say, look, I, I'm scared something might go wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to try. Um, and that is just so inspiring. Mm. Uh, thinking back to what these women did, I mean, I think you went through about 16, 16 centuries. Is that right? From Yeah. From birth, yeah. I'm just trying to think. I, I struggle to really sort of envision traveling and doing adventures without the comforts of technology and GPS yeah. and being able to contact home and, and almost being able to plan and research the different trips. Um, I mean, do you remember reading about a woman who went on, you know, a, a completely sort of off the road, traveled across the continent, did something where there was none of that support, none of that sort of help? If something goes wrong, then it, it goes wrong and it can end up in sort of very tragic circumstances. Yeah, but loads of them did it. You see that? That's the thing. You, you can't just say one of them. So many women just went out into the unknown, into the blanks on the map. And some of them, like Gertrude Bell, who's quite well known, she went to um, Arabia in the Middle East because she wanted to fill in those blanks on the map and, and she wanted to discover and to explore. And she was... Um, quite a politician as well so so she had that sort of motivation but some women just went there because they wanted to see what was over the horizon I mean that there's people like Mary Kingsley who went to Africa she went to West Africa Cameroon um I mean it it's a dangerous enough place to go for sort of sheltered western women even now I and mean, she was a highly sheltered western woman she she hadn't even been to school let alone to university or anything um and yet she went to west africa which was known as the white man's grave then um and she just immersed herself in in the local culture she was a great anthropologist she traveled about all over the place she relied on local people for for all her help um she she did say that um, you should never go around Africa in things you would be ashamed to be seen in at home. So she, you know, she kind of had certain standards that she wanted to keep up for herself and for her home country. But there was no precedent. That's the thing. I find it so hard to get my head around. You know, they weren't following in anybody's footsteps. They were going out and breaking the barriers themselves. Yeah, incredible. I recently um, just read Jackie Hill uh, Murray's book, or is it Murphy? You know, Jackie Hill Murray's book, and she wrote about adventuresses, and she actually re redid those journeys um, and ended up going to West Africa to reclimb you know, the same mountain that Mary Kingsley climbed. And it's just quite fascinating of how difficult she found it, even in modern times, and, you know, trying yeah. to imagine what it would be like sort of going back to, to when she climbed it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And another one of the but sorry, go on. Well, I just can say that there are two sides to that, though. I mean, you say you, you'd find it difficult to, to do it without modern communications. And and, and she did, did indeed find it difficult because she could imagine all the things that might go wrong. But I think a lot of the Victorian women and women who were travelling before then were quite naive. And, and it didn't occur to them that something would go wrong. And they had no vision of all the, the terrible things that might happen. I think partly because they were um, born in the sort of golden age of empire, they had this, I think they, they just thought that British people were completely um, impregnable, you know, that no, nothing could possibly happen to them because they were British and also because they were women and so people would treat them well. And um, so there was a, a crashing naivety about a lot of these people. But in a strange sort of way, I think that's what kept them safe because they didn't think anything would happen. And so nothing did. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. I suppose now with, with technology, you get to hear about all the dangers. And unfortunately, you know, media can, can be so negative all of the time. Um, another one of the books that you wrote was Unsuitable for Ladies and Am Anthology of women travellers. Um, you know, real ladies do not travel, or so the guidebooks used to say. I mean, that must have been fascinating. You know, writing about that. How did that come about? Well, that followed straight on from Wayward Women, really, because having written about the women themselves, um, the publishers and I thought it might be a nice idea to actually have their voices speaking. So I had the 
fabulous job of choosing my favourite um, travel writers um, among women and um, doing this anthology. Um, oh, it was such a treat. I loved it. Who did you, who did you pick? Oh, hundreds. <laughs> loads and loads and loads. Yeah. I mean, Mary Kingsley's there, but but also people who who had kept diaries, travel diaries, you know, that were never even published. But but they just tell us so much. And, and that in turn led to another book about um, emigrant settlers and, you know, sort of pioneer colonialists around the world. And that was mostly from letters and diaries and things. And again, it's sort of history straight from the horse's mouth, explaining what it was like when you settled in a new country, having left your family um you know, half a world and six months behind you because you couldn't um, get any meaningful um, contact with them in any sooner time. Um, and I, I found that really interesting. And that's where that spirit really came through, because women were going to a new and unknown world and were investing their time, their their money, their energy, their lives in many cases, so that the next generation or the generation after that might benefit um, and that was extraordinary. Which female traveller did you read about and just go, oh, I mean, I'm sure it was all of them, to be fair. But again, which, you know, which sort of story stood out for you or that you just thought, how is that even possible? There was one woman called Dr. Susie Reinhardt. She was a missionary um, based in China with her husband and her baby. And she and her husband decided that they had been called to take the word of God to Lhasa, which was the capital of Tibet then. Um, and this is in the, oh, when was it, 1890s, I think. And at that time, Lhasa was known as the Forbidden City. No, no Westerners were allowed in, and they were usually killed when they got to the gates. But Susie and Petrus, her husband, and the baby Charlie, they set out on, oh, it must be the most inhospitable terrain on earth to go from China um, into Tibet. And they were months and months and months on the journey. Well, that's a bit of an um, exaggeration. They were, they were months on the journey. Um, terrible, terrible winter weather. And in quick succession, the small group of helpers that they'd taken with them, porters and things, ran away. They lost all but one of their ponies. Um, and then the baby got ill very, very quickly, very swiftly got ill, fell unconscious. And then he died. And this was on the road from China to, well, road is, is uh, it's not a road, it's a track, but, but on the way from China to Tibet. And all they could do was put this little baby's body in a wooden medicine box that they had with them. The ground was too hard to bury him. And Susie writes about going onwards towards Tibet. They still went onwards and watching this little box get smaller and smaller on the horizon. They got to Lhasa um, and they were turned back. Of course, they were turned back, but they were lucky they weren't killed. So then they had to make the journey back towards China. And winter was really setting in by now. And at one stage, they got completely lost. And so they made camp by a river. And Susie stayed by the miserable amount of belongings they still had at this stage, while Petrus crossed the river to um, try and get help from a camp they could see just, just across the way. Um, and off he went. And he didn't come back that evening, but Susie thought, well, that's OK, because he's obviously organising a guiding party. Um, but he didn't come back the next day either. And in fact, she never saw him again. And she had to make the journey back to China, having lost her child, having lost her husband, not having succeeded in the mission and entirely alone. And also with the knowledge that the people who had killed Petrus were probably now after her for the belongings that she had. And not only did she get back to China, but soon afterwards, she remarried and she set out again to make the same journey. And I just find that sort of spirit unbelievable. Oh, it's just incredible. And and um, I don't want, obviously, don't want to do a spoiler, but did she make it the second time? Do you really want to know? Oh, I think I... Oh, yes. <laughs> no, she died. Oh, no. I know. <laughs> but, she, oh, wow. God, it must, your emotion, I mean, I, I can feel sort of my emotions like going up and down. And, I know. But reading the, you know, researching these women, writing, writing these books and, you know, going what, going what they, um, 
you know, imagining what they went through. I think I'm like a very visual person, so I can almost like put myself yes. in that situation. Yeah. And yes, that's right. And imagine what it must have been like. It puts you through the ringer. And I, I did a book about the, the British women who were involved in the so-called Indian mutiny in 1857 or the first war of independence um, in India. And that meant going to archives um, and reading letters that were sent home by women who were caught up in um, in the mutiny and in massacres and things. And that was heartbreaking because you would, you would open an envelope and there would be a letter in it and there'd be a little packet and you'd open up the little packet and there would be a lock of a child's hair. And then you'd read the letter and, and it would say, the mutineers are coming. I know I'm not going to survive. This is all that will remain of our family, this little lock of hair. Keep it, keep it safe. I'm almost crying now. It was just just heart-wrenching to do the research on that especially when it's personal letters and personal diaries and lockets of of yes. hair yes i think i think it's almost uh, very easy when it's when it's things like history is almost to be able to distance yourself from it it's very easy to to read the stories but actually when it's that close it's just oh wow what and it? also i think when when you're a woman reading about women that there's there's some special link or, or I certainly felt that um and and at that time I was quite a new mother and and so there was that as well um and the emotions were just so strong well, I mean so so that was a what was that what was the title of that book called that was called Angels of Albion wow we and I mean what did you learn most about from, from writing from writing from writing that book I learnt to distrust the history that I've been taught at school, um, because not necessarily about the Indian Mutiny, but but about Victorian history, I, I was taught that it was all about sort of military strategy and politics, and and if there was a rebellion anywhere in the empire, then it was the rebels who were at fault. Um, but when I actually read what the women in India were saying about the British and the Indians, it was clear to me that there was a lot of fellow feeling or sisterly feeling between um, the British women and a lot of the Indians, because, of course, they had Indian nannies, ayahs for their children. And often, I don't know how much you know about the, the Indian mutiny or the First War of Independence, but it meant that soldiers were rising up against the British. And there were several massacres in towns around British India. And in many cases, Indian women sheltered British women and their families from the Indian mutineers. So that there was a very close relationship. And one woman I remember that I was researching said that she felt that she was as much a subject of British imperialism as a woman as the Indians were. And this just turned what I'd learnt and what I'd understood before upside down. Um, and it meant that there weren't clear cut lines anymore about um, certainly about the history of the British Empire. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and history is obviously well. Oh, what's, that, what's that great quote that um, if the, the source is anonymous, it was generally a woman because you just don't get to hear hear fem female stories. One of the interesting things with with it being two thousand and eighteen is um, is it's the year when some women got the got the vote. Um, and you've recently written um, a book about this, a, a new book which has which has come out called Hearts and Minds. Uh, the untold story of the great pilgrimage on and how women won the vote. I can almost, I think what's lovely is I can almost sort of see this this journey of of your books and and the stories that you're sharing and telling. Just share a little bit more about why you decided to write this book. Well, as a historian who specialises in in women's history, there was no way I was going to let 2018 go past without writing a book of some sort to to celebrate what you rightly say was was um, some women getting the vote a hundred years ago. Um, but I know I, I knew that I needed a new angle, um, and I've always admired the suffragettes and and everything that they've done, but felt slightly distanced from them. I've, I've always felt it quite difficult to to identify with the suffragettes. And while I was doing some preliminary research, I came across a mention of the Great Pilgrimage. And I thought, well, what's the Great Pilgrimage? I've never heard of it. And it turns out that the suffragettes, the militant ones, were just a minority of campaigners for votes for women. The vast majority were suffragists. 
who were the non-militant campaigners. And they did some amazing things to try and persuade Parliament and the people that giving the vote to women would not bring the country to its knees within moments, which is what one of the arguments was. And their grand gesture, really, in the whole of their campaign, which lasted for over 50 years, was this amazing Women's March, which took place in uh, 1913. It took six weeks. It started from six major points around the UK. So Newcastle and Carlisle in the north, um, Land's End, uh, various places on the south coast and Kent and East Anglia. And the routes converged on London six weeks after the furthest one set off in a huge rally involving 50,000 people in Hyde Park. Um, And I just hadn't heard of this thing. And I realised that it was all sorts of women marching together. So it was aristocrats marching with mill hands, marching with housewives, marching with children, marching with intellectuals. There were men as well as women, although the vast majority were women. And it was this that finally persuaded Prime Minister Asquith, who had been no friend to to women's suffrage over the years, it finally persuaded him that women could be counted as people in a political sense. So therefore, they will be covered under a representation of the People Act, which is what we're celebrating the centenary of. Um, So it was a hugely significant event um, that I hadn't even heard of. And I barely knew the difference between suffragettes and suffragists, let alone knowing about the pilgrimage. I was going to say, what, how would you just, what is a suffragette? For somebody who's listening, thinking, I hear this all the time, but actually, what is the definition of it? A suffragette was somebody who belonged to the WSPU, which was the Women's Social and Political Union, headed by Mrs. Pankhurst. And they believed in deeds, not words, which everybody will be familiar with, which translated at its most extreme to um, using violence to shock people into listening to them. And in, in, in a way, I don't still don't quite understand shock parliament into giving them a vote by setting fire to things and throwing bombs and hurling stones. Um, But of course, Parliament said, well, how can we possibly give the vote to these people? Look at them. They set fire to things. They throw bombs. They they chuck stones. And besides that, they're women. And everybody knows that women are, and this is a quote, subject to physiological emergencies. In other words, they're completely out of it for one week in every four. So, and, and also, everybody knows that what fills a woman's head is, there's a lovely cartoon about this in the book, is uh, puppy dogs, boxes of chocolates, um, gentlemen with very fine moustaches, wedding rings. There's, there's nothing of any substance up there. So why would you ever give a woman a vote? So the question started with what's a suffragette? That's what suffragettes were fighting against. And the way they chose to fight against it was with militancy. But the suffragists believed in what was called law abiding campaigning. So they didn't believe in using violence or militancy. They used in and they believed in using persuasion and they believed in demonstration rather than protest. Um, And they believed that it was up to them to show that women were capable of doing great things and that if you gave them the vote, they were capable of changing the world into a far better place for everyone. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, I'm just thinking about the Great Pilgrimage and then, you know, the the Women's March, which is all, you know, always like, well, actually, no, I suppose like 99 years or whatever difference. And it still seems as though we're almost still fighting for fighting for the same things. You know what? It's it's the same narrative. It really is the same narrative. It it may have begun in 1913 with this amazing um, great pilgrimage. But then we've got the Jarrow March in 1936. That's part of the same narrative. We get the Green and Connan women in, in the 70s and, and 80s. That's part of the same narrative. And we get the marches that we've had in the past couple of years um, in America, in here and, and elsewhere. And that's part of the same thing. It's putting one foot in front of the other. It's doing what you can, having the confidence that it'll count because so many people are doing what they can. And I just find it really kind of thrilling in a way that that we're still doing what these pilgrims these these suffrage pilgrims started out i mean those two marches that you just mentioned the the one in 1936 did you say that was a jarrow yeah the jarrow march it was 200 um working men from jarrow who marched down to london um to protest about um wages and conditions and it's actually 
pretty famous and, and far more people will have heard of the chariot march than they will have heard of the pilgrimage. I can count the number of people who heard about the pilgrimage before you know, the book came out and before people started researching the centenary, I can count the number of people on one hand. Yeah. I mean, what's it like putting out um, a, a book a book in sort of 2018 about this subject? It's it's really exciting and it feels a huge privilege, especially as I'm lucky enough to have found um, an aspect of the uh, of the centenary and, and of the subject that is really important, but is really underrepresented and, and really um hasn't been written about before and as usual with my books I, I've tried to go straight back to primary sources so I found a number of diaries um, and letters that were written by women who were on the march on various different routes so it's like some great road movie you know it, it's women of all backgrounds discovering themselves discovering each other and discovering that together in this sort of solidarity of sisterhood, which is so new to them, they really can make a difference. So it's been thrilling to do that and to have the book come out at a time when it's such a live subject, not just because of the centenary, but because of Me Too and all that. Mm. You know, you said like the solid solidarity of sisterhood and, you know, different women, different women from all backgrounds. What was what was being written in their diaries? What was what was the feelings that they were sharing at that time? The feeling of excitement, first of all, um, because a lot of these women had not really left their villages or towns before. Um, a feeling of apprehension, because um, if you were, say, a mill worker and you said to your boss, look, I'm taking six weeks off. I've been saving up. I'm taking six weeks off because I want to march to London for the vote. There was no guarantee you were going to get your job back at the end of it. And maybe you were the breadwinner for the family. So there was real fear that, that people were taking a huge risk in, in making this um, pilgrimage. Um, so, so there's fear as well as excitement. There's a sort of bewilderment, not quite knowing what's going to happen and how it's going to happen, because nobody had done this before. And there's this lovely feeling of, of camaraderie, of, of discovering people that are like-minded, even if they don't come from the same background as you, which is, um, that that's, it speaks volumes, I think, to me of the potential these women had. And, and what you're watching on a march like this is the realisation of potential. And, and it did feel, fill people with, with a sort of bewildered sense of wonder, really, when they were on the road. And something else I should mention when I was talking about fear, it wasn't just the fear that you wouldn't get your job back or, or that your family would be cross with you or something when you got back. It was a real fear of violence because a lot of the people who attended the meetings that the pilgrims held all along the way thought that they were suffragettes, thought that they were militants. And this is 1913. It's when the militant suffragette campaign is at its height. So the violence is at its height. And people were really scared that these women were out looking for trouble. And so the way that they received them in their towns and villages was often with violence. So they, they had stuff thrown at them. They tried to overturn the platforms. There, there was mob violence on more than one occasion. And that was seriously scary. Oh, God, I can't, I can't even imagine. It's just... Um... She's absolutely inspiring, you know, what they put themselves put themselves through. The fear from from violence, their fear of, you know, what, what they were doing, but obviously knowing knowing that they were doing it for, for the right reasons. Did you read any diary accounts of um of when some women did? So so it was to my to my knowledge, and please do correct me if I'm wrong, that it was white women who were married over the age of thirty who got the vote. It was um you didn't have to be married. I mean, that, that was a passport to the vote. If you were married, um, you had to have um, own your own house or pay rent of more than I think it was £10 um, to to qualify. Or you had to have a university degree or you had to be over 30. Um, so so lots of lots of working women um, got the vote if, you know, if, if they paid rent or, or own their own house. Um, or were married or were over 30. So it, it wasn't really a class issue. But some of the people who went on the pilgrimage, and they only went on the pilgrimage because they'd been working campaigning for women's suffrage for years before that, um, they didn't get the vote in, in 1918 because maybe 
they they lived with their parents or something and they hadn't married and they hadn't been to university so they might have been over 30 but but they didn't have any of the other qualifications so it was by no means all women that got the vote and in 1918 and, and as i'm sure you know it took another 10 years before we got universal suffrage did you read any diaries for, from that time period of when of of that sort of this monumental occasion and what was written about it um what I did read about the, the first election itself was um, newspaper accounts, which were really interesting. Um, I, I tried to read as many regional accounts as before because the received wisdom is that not many people voted, uh, not many women voted, sorry, um, because they now that it sort of came to the crunch, they felt a bit scared about what they were supposed to do. Um, and in fact, many of them didn't know what they were supposed to do. There's a lovely story of one, one woman who went to the polling booth and um, very carefully got the bit of paper and made her mark on it and then folded it up and put it in a handbag and walked out. Um, there's another one who, who very carefully made her mark on the bit of paper, turned round to speak to a friend, turned back and just saw a corner of the bit of paper disappearing down her baby's throat <laughs> my baby ate my vote um oh. so yeah i think the newspaper accounts are really interesting because they gave me statistics they gave me an overview rather than just one diary so in fact i learned that many many women voted often in constituencies more women than men and they didn't all vote um the way their husbands did and um it, it just gives you a snapshot if you, if you read the contemporary accounts of what was going on all around the country, which I found really interesting. Absolutely fascinating. I, I can't wait to, to, to read your book, Hearts and Minds. Um, and Jane, what's going to be next for you? Are you going to be taking a break from book writing or have you already sort of got your next idea? Yeah, yeah. Contract signed and, and the research has begun on the next one. Oh, fab. Can you tell us more? <laughs> yes, it's going to be about the first women who went into the traditional professions. So, you know, law and medicine, um, architecture and engineering and the church. And the reason why is because in 1919, shortly after some women got the vote, there was a, um, a law passed that was supposed to do away with any sort of sexual discrimination in the workplace. Ha ha. And any sort <laughs> yes. of gender gap. Ha ha. Um, and, and I was just interested to see how that affected real women and whether they found it easy to get into the professions after that because that was what it was designed to if not why not or if they did how come um so that's what i've started on and i was doing some research um the other day and the um royal institute of british architects in london and finding out why they argued so vociferously against women being architects and I came up with a definitive answer which was um, put forward in about 1920 and the reason why women can't be architects is because everybody knows that women can't climb ladders oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> and this is 1920 so I think this one's going to be a humdinger wowzers I mean when you said that a law came in in 1919 about like sexual discrimination, I was actually thinking, are, are you joking? I thought there was only like 20 years ago a law came in. To, yeah. to, to, oh, to, it, it was actually called the Sex Disqualification Removal Act. It just makes you feel so disheartened. <laughs> just... <laughs> I know, I know. Well, as I said earlier on, this is all one long narrative. It's all the same narrative and chapters come and chapters go, but we haven't got to the end yet. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be a fascinating research for for you. Absolutely amazing. I I recently I'm I'm doing my dissertation at the moment, and I've been trying to do research into female adventurers. So I'm, I was looking at the Royal uh, Geographical Society, and, yes. you know, and when they first allowed women in, and what the arguments were for and against yeah. it. And it's just it is honestly fascinating. And you think times have changed, but um, yeah, mm -hmm. maybe they yes. haven't. <laughs> So, Jane, where is the best place for people to find out more about you and also to go and buy your book? Uh, I've got a website, which is jane-robinson.com. And I've got a blog as well, um, which is Jane Robinson Author. Um, and I guess just just get hold of the books in the library or, or the bookshop, because I, I hope that, that you'll warm to the people I write about as much as I do. 
because I, I love writing about characters, about people who don't conform to stereotypes. Um, I, I would like to think that the whole of my writing career is is involved in shattering stereotypes. Um, and we all know how, how how much women are stereotyped in history. So, yeah, just just um, welcome in. Have a look at the books, have a look at the blog and the website and um, see if it lights any touch papers. And Jane, any final words of wisdom or advice that you'd like to leave with us from you know, all of your research, for, from this narrative that you are sharing with us through all of your, you know, 10 books so far, the 11th on the way. What advice do you have for other women out there? Oh, gosh, that that's a difficult one. But I, say, I guess I, if I, I could make it even narrow. So advice for women who are maybe feeling a little bit disheartened. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I guess what, what I have taken out of them all is that just don't be scared of being judged. Just just be true to yourself. And, and um, if if the way you perceive yourself to be is different from, from the norm and different from other people, well, never mind. That makes it all the richer. And just, just try and have confidence. And I know that's so much easier said than done but a lot of my women started out on their adventures with huge trepidation and um massive imposter syndrome looming over them but but just step by step like these pilgrims just do it step by step and it'll just be so satisfying absolutely a hundred percent jane thank you so much for coming on the tough girl podcast to share more about all of these incredible women that you've written about huge pleasure Hey Tribe, I hope you're having a fabulous International Women's Day. I personally believe that we should have International Women's Day every single day of the year, but it's nice to do something a little bit different and to speak to somebody who isn't an adventurer or an explorer or an athlete, but somebody who who is sort of behind the scenes writing the book. So really great to get Jane on board and learn more about her background and the books that she's written and obviously hear those stories that she shared. Now, last year, we actually spoke to Catherine Mayer. Um, that was for our special International Women's Day episode. Um, episode. Catherine's a best-selling author and award-winning journalist and the co-founder of the Women's Equality Party. And she shared more about her book, which came out called Attack of the 50-Foot Woman, How Gender Equality Can Save the World. So although that episode is a year old, it is still incredibly relevant. And if you're interested in women, women's rights, equality, then please do go take a listen to that episode as well. So the reason I've been able to interview both Catherine and Jane um, on these sort of special days is because of Tough Girl Extra. So Tough Girl Extra is when I go back and do sort of special episodes or speak to previous guests on the Tough Girl podcast to follow up with them to see what they've been up to. And I also speak to members of the Tough Girl tribe. It's a little bit of a mixture. I haven't done as many episodes as I'd like to do. It is something which is on my to-do list. And once I reach 250 patrons on Patreon, I'll be able to start producing more of this content on a regular basis. But if you go to the website, toughgirlchallenges.com, you can find the page and there's maybe about sort of 15 different episodes. We've spoken with Emma Timmis again, Joe Bradshaw, Aaron Bastian, Amy Hughes. Um, there's also a couple of episodes from me on there. So uh, when Ali Mahoney Johnson interviewed me for I Think Sport, um, I shared that episode. There's also a couple of episodes on me with my reflections on 2016, the plans for 2017. We've caught up again with Challenge Sophie, so Sophie Radcliffe. We've also spoken to members of the Tough Girl Tart Tribe, Laura Gush, Sarah Logan. We've also caught up with Anna McNuff. Um, there's also a quick fire round with Beth French. So it's sort of a little bit of extra variety. And if you subscribe to the podcast, you'll automatically get these episodes downloaded. But if not, go and check out toughgirlchallenges.com and you can see all of the incredible women that we've interviewed. I also have an episode with Anne-Marie Watson, which is going to be coming out soon. So anne is an incredible incredible runner, incredible coach, loads of advice, loads of great tips. And we hear more about what she's been up to since we last spoke to her a year ago. I think that's the crazy thing is that sometimes I'm like, 
oh, it's like a year since we last spoke because there's quite a few other women that I do want to catch up with, Natalia Cohen. Also want to catch up with two of the women that we interviewed from Ice Maiden. So we spoke to them back in 2015 at the very, very start of their challenge, which they've recently just completed. So Nick and Nat. So I want to get those ladies back on the podcast as well. So there is lots happening. If you want to find out more, check out toughgirlchallenges.com, subscribe to the newsletter, like the Facebook page, send me a tweet. Always love to hear what you are up to. Please become a patron. You know the mission. You know what I'm about. Um, Help me to support this. If you get value from the podcast, then please do contribute $5 a month. It makes a massive difference. $10 if you can. Um, It just allows me to produce more of this incredible content and to share more of these stories, which are just so inspiring and so motivational. Thank you to everybody who listens. I really do appreciate it. Lots of love. I'll be back with you next Tuesday for another awesome episode of the Tough Girl Podcast. Take care. Bye. Bye.